Chapter Three of *The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection* by Charles Darwin, read for LibriVox.org by Michael Armenta. Chapter Three: Struggle for Existence. Its bearing on natural selection, the term used in a wide sense, geometrical ratio of increase, rapid increase of naturalized animals and plants nature of the checks to increase, competition, universal, effects of climate, protection from the number of individuals, complex relations of all animals and plants throughout nature, struggle for life most severe between individuals and varieties of the same species, often severe between species of the same genus, the relation of organism to organism, the most important of all relations. Before entering on the subject of this chapter, I must make a few preliminary remarks to show how the struggle for existence bears on natural selection. It has been seen in the last chapter that among organic beings in a state of nature there is some individual variability. Indeed, I am not aware that this has ever been disputed. It is immaterial for us whether a multitude of doubtful forms be called species, or subspecies, or varieties. What rank, for instance, the two or three hundred doubtful forms of British plants are entitled to hold, if the existence of any well-marked varieties be admitted, but the mere existence of individual variability and of some few well-marked varieties, though necessary as the foundation for the work, helps us but little in understanding how species arise in nature. How have all those exquisite adaptations of one part of the organization to another part, and to the conditions of life, and of one organic being to another being, then perfected. We see these beautiful co-adaptations most plainly in the woodpecker and the mistletoe, and only a little less plainly in the humblest parasite which clings to the hairs of a quadruped or feathers of a bird, in the structure of the beetle which dives through the water, in the plumed seed which is wafted by the gentlest breeze. In short, we see beautiful adaptations everywhere and in every part of the organic world. Again, it may be asked, how is it that varieties, which I have called incipient species, become ultimately converted into good and distinct species, which in most cases obviously differ from each other far more than do the varieties of the same species? How do those groups of species, which constitute what are called distinct genera, and which differ from each other more than do the species of the same genus, arise? All these results, as we shall more fully see in the next chapter, follow from the struggle for life. Owing to the struggle, variations, however slight, and from whatever cause proceeding, if they be in any degree profitable to the individuals of a species, in their infinitely complex relations to other organic beings and to their physical conditions of life, will tend to the preservation of such individuals and will generally be inherited by the offspring. The offspring also will thus have a better chance of surviving, for, of the many individuals of any species which are periodically born, but a small number can survive. I have called this principle, by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved, by the term natural selection, in order to mark its relation to man's power of selection. But the expression often used by Mr. Herbert Spencer of the survival of the fittest is more accurate and is sometimes equally convenient. We have seen that man, by selection, can certainly produce great results, and can adapt organic beings to his own uses through the accumulation of slight but useful variations given to him by the hand of nature. But natural selection, we shall hereafter see, is a power incessantly ready for action, and is as immeasurably superior to man's feeble efforts as the works of nature are to those of art. We will now discuss in a little more detail the struggle for existence. In my future work this subject will be treated, as it well deserves, at greater length. The elder, de Candol, and Lyell, have largely and philosophically shown that all organic beings are exposed to severe competition. 
in regard to plants no one has treated this subject with more spirit and ability than w herbert dean of manchester evidently the result of his great horticultural knowledge nothing is easier than to admit in words the truth of the universal struggle for life or more difficult at least i found it so than constantly to bear this conclusion in mind yet unless it be thoroughly ingrained in the mind the whole economy of nature with every fact on distribution rarity abundance extinction and variation will be dimly seen or quite misunderstood we behold the face of nature bright with gladness we often see superabundance of food we do not see or we forget that the birds which are idly singing round us mostly live on insects or seeds and are thus constantly destroying life or we forget how largely these songsters or their eggs or their nestlings are destroyed by birds and beasts of prey we do not always bear in mind that though food be now superabundant it is not so at all seasons of each recurring year the term struggle for existence used in a large sense i should premise that i use this term in a large and metaphorical sense including dependence of one being on another and including which is more important not only the life of the individual but success in leaving progeny two canine animals in a time of dearth may be truly said to struggle with each other which shall get food and live but a plant on the edge of a desert is said to struggle for life against the drought though more properly it should be said to be dependent on the moisture a plant which annually produces a thousand seeds of which only one of an average comes to maturity may be more truly said to struggle with the plants of the same and other kinds which already clothe the ground the mistletoe is dependent on the apple and a few other trees but can only in a far-fetched sense be said to struggle with these trees for if too many of these parasites grow on the same tree it languishes and dies but several seedling mistletoes growing close together on the same branch may more truly be said to struggle with each other as the mistletoe is disseminated by birds its existence depends on them and it may metaphorically be said to struggle with other fruit-bearing plants in tempting the birds to devour and thus disseminate its seeds in these several senses which pass into each other i use for convenience sake the general term of struggle for existence geometrical ratio of increase a struggle for existence inevitably follows from the high rate at which all organic beings tend to increase every being which during its natural lifetime produces several eggs or seeds must suffer destruction during some period of its life and during some season or occasional year otherwise on the principle of geometrical increase its numbers would quickly become so inordinately great that no country could support the product hence as more individuals are produced than can possibly survive there must in every case be a struggle for existence either one individual with another of the same species or with the individuals of distinct species or with the physical conditions of life it is the doctrine of malthus applied with manifold force to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms for in this case there can be no artificial increase of food and no prudential restraint from marriage although some species may be now increasing more or less rapidly in numbers all cannot do so for the world would not hold them there is no exception to the rule that every organic being naturally increases at so high a rate that if not destroyed the earth would soon be covered by the progeny of a single pair even slow breeding man has doubled in twenty-five years and at this rate in less than a thousand years there would literally not be standing room for his progeny linnaeus has calculated that if an annual plant produced only two seeds 
and there is no plant so unproductive as this, and their seedlings next year produced two, and so on, then in twenty years there would be a million plants. The elephant is reckoned the slowest breeder of all known animals, and I have taken some pains to estimate its probable minimum rate of natural increase. It will be safest to assume that it begins breeding when thirty years old, and goes on breeding till ninety years old, bringing forth six young in the interval, and surviving till one hundred years old. If this be so, after a period of from seven hundred and forty to seven hundred and fifty years, there would be nearly nineteen million elephants alive, descended from the first pair. But we have better evidence on this subject than mere theoretical calculations, namely, the numerous recorded cases of the astonishingly rapid increase of various animals in a state of nature. When circumstances have been favorable to them during two or three following seasons, still more striking is the evidence from our domestic animals of many kinds which have run wild in several parts of the world. If the statement of the rate of increase of slow breeding cattle and horses in South America, and latterly in Australia, had not been well authenticated, would have been incredible. So it is with plants. Cases could be given of introduced plants which have become common throughout whole islands in a period of less than ten years. Several of the plants, such as the cardoon and tall thistle, which are now the commonest over the wide plains of La Plata, clothing square leagues of surface, almost to the exclusion of every other plant, have been introduced from Europe, and there are plants which now range in India, as I hear from Dr. Falconer, from Cape Comorin to the Himalaya, which have been imported from America since its discovery. In such cases, and endless others could be given, no one supposes that the fertility of the animals or plants has been suddenly and temporarily increased in any sensible degree. The obvious explanation is that the conditions of life have been highly favorable and that there has consequently been less destruction of the old and young, and that nearly all the young have been enabled to breed. Their geometrical ratio of increase, the result of which never fails to be surprising, simply explains their extraordinarily rapid increase and wide diffusion in their new homes. In a state of nature, almost every full-grown plant annually produces seed, and among animals there are very few which do not annually pair. Hence, we may confidently assert that all plants and animals are tending to increase at a geometrical ratio, that all would rapidly stock every station in which they could, anyhow, exist, and that this geometrical tendency to increase must be checked by destruction at some period of life. Our familiarity with the larger domestic animals tends, I think, to mislead us. We see no great destruction falling on them, and we do not keep in mind that thousands are annually slaughtered for food, and that in a state of nature an equal number would have somehow to be disposed of. The only difference between organisms which annually produce eggs or seeds by the thousand, and those which produce extremely few, is that the slow breeders would require a few more years to people, under favorable conditions, a whole district, let it be ever so large. The condor lays a couple of eggs, the ostrich a score, and yet in the same country the condor may be the more numerous of the two. The fulmar petrel lays but one egg, yet it is believed to be the most numerous bird in the world. One fly deposits hundreds of eggs, and another, like the hippobosca, a single one. But this difference does not determine how many individuals of the two species can be supported in a district. A large number of eggs is of some importance to those species which depend on a fluctuating amount of food, for it allows them rapidly to increase in number. But the real importance of a large number of eggs or seeds is to make up for much destruction at some period of life, and this period, in the great majority of cases, is an early one. If an animal can in any way protect its own eggs or young, a small number may be produced, 
and yet the average stock be fully kept up but if many eggs or young are destroyed many must be produced or the species will become extinct it would suffice to keep up the full number of a tree which lived on an average for a thousand years if a single seed were produced once in a thousand years supposing that this seed were never destroyed and could be ensured to germinate in a fitting place so that in all cases the average number of any animal or plant depends only indirectly on the number of its eggs or seeds in looking at nature it is most necessary to keep the foregoing considerations always in mind never to forget that every single organic being may be said to be striving to the utmost to increase in numbers that each lives by a struggle at some period of its life that heavy destruction inevitably falls either on the young or old during each generation or at recurrent intervals lighten any check mitigate the destruction ever so little and the number of the species will almost instantaneously increase to any amount nature of the checks to increase the causes which check the natural tendency of each species to increase are the most obscure look at the most vigorous species by as much as it swarms in numbers by so much will it tend to increase still further we know not exactly what the checks are even in a single instance nor will this surprise any one who reflects how ignorant we are on this head even in regard to mankind although so incomparably better known than any other animal this subject of the checks to increase have been ably treated by several authors and i hope in a future work to discuss it at considerable length more especially in regard to the feral animals of south america here i will make only a few remarks just to recall to the reader's mind some of the chief points eggs or very young animals seem generally to suffer most but this is not invariably the case with plants there is a vast destruction of seeds but from some observations which i have made it appears that the seedlings suffer most from germinating in ground already thickly stocked with other plants already thickly stocked with other plants seedlings also are destroyed in the vast numbers by various enemies for instance on a piece of ground three feet long and two wide dug and cleared and where there could be no choking from other plants i marked all the seedlings from our native weeds as they came up and out of three hundred and fifty-seven no less than two hundred and ninety-five were destroyed chiefly by slugs and insects if turf which has long been mown and the case would be the same with turf closely browsed by quadrupeds be let to grow the more vigorous plants gradually kill the less vigorous though fully grown plants thus out of twenty species grown on a little plot of mown turf three feet by four nine species perished from the other species being allowed to grow up freely the amount of food for each species of course gives the extreme limit to which each can survive but very frequently it is not the obtaining food but the serving as prey to other animals which determines the average number of a species thus there seems to be little doubt that a stock of partridges grouse and hares on any large estate depends chiefly on the destruction of vermin if not one head of game were shot during the next twenty years in england and at the same time if no vermin were destroyed there would in all probability be less game than at present although hundreds of thousands of game animals are now annually shot on the other hand in some cases as with the elephant none are destroyed by beasts of prey for even the tiger in india most rarely dares to attack a young elephant protected by its name climate plays an important part in determining the average numbers of a species and periodical seasons of extreme cold or drought seem to be the most effective of all checks i estimated chiefly from the greatly reduced numbers of nests in the spring that the winter of eighteen fifty four to five 
destroyed four-fifths of the birds in my own grounds, and this is a tremendous destruction when we remember that ten per cent is an extraordinarily severe mortality rate from epidemics with man the action of climate seems at first sight to be quite independent of the struggle for existence but in so far as climate chiefly acts in reducing food it brings on the most severe struggle between the individuals whether of the same or of distinct species which subsist on the same kind of food even when climate for instance extreme cold acts directly for instance extreme cold acts directly it will be the least vigorous individuals or those which have got least food through the advancing winter which will suffer the most when we travel from south to north or from a damp region to a dry we invariably see some species gradually getting rarer and rarer and finally disappearing and the change of climate being conspicuous we are tempted to attribute the whole effect to its direct action but this is a false view we forget that each species even where it most abounds is constantly suffering enormous destruction at some period of its life from enemies or from competitors for the same place and food and if these enemies or competitors be in the least degree favoured by any slight change of climate they will increase in numbers and as each area is already fully stocked with inhabitants the other species must decrease when we travel southward and see a species decreasing in numbers we may feel assured that the cause lies quite as much in other species being favoured as in this one being hurt so it is when we travel northward but in a somewhat lesser degree for the number of species of all kinds and therefore of competitors decreases northward hence in going northward or in ascending a mountain we far oftener meet with stunted forms due to the directly injurious action of climate than we do in proceeding southward or in descending a mountain when we reach the arctic regions or snow-capped summits or absolute deserts the struggle for life is almost exclusively with the elements that climate acts in main part indirectly by favouring other species we clearly see in the prodigious number of plants which in our gardens can perfectly well endure our climate but which never become naturalized for they cannot compete with our native plants nor resist destruction by our native animals when a species owing to highly favourable circumstances increase inordinately in numbers in a small tract epidemics at least this seems generally to occur with our game animals often ensue and here we have a limiting check independent of the struggle for life but even some of these so-called epidemics appear to be due to parasitic worms which have from some cause possibly in part through facility of diffusion among the crowded animals been disproportionately favoured and here comes in a sort of struggle between the parasite and its prey on the other hand in many cases a large stock of individuals of the same species relatively to the number of its enemies is absolutely necessary for its preservation on the other hand in many cases a large stock of individuals of the same species relatively to the number of its enemies is absolutely necessary for its preservation thus we can easily raise plenty of corn and rape seed etc in our fields because the seeds are in great excess compared with the number of birds which feed on them nor can the birds though having a superabundance of food at this one season increase in number proportionally to the supply of seed as their numbers are checked during the winter but any one who has tried knows how troublesome it is to get seed from a few wheat or other such plants in a garden i have in this case lost every single seed this view of the necessity of a large stock of the same species for its preservation explains 
i believe some singular facts in nature such as that of very rare plants being sometimes extremely abundant in the few spots where they do exist and that of some social plants being social that is abounding in individuals even on the extreme verge of their range for in such cases we may believe that a plant could exist only where the conditions of its life were so favourable that many could exist together and thus save the species from utter destruction i should add that the good effects of intercrossing and the ill effects of close interbreeding no doubt come to play in many of these cases but i will not here enlarge on this subject complex relations of all animals and plants to each other in the struggle for existence many cases are on record showing how complex and unexpected are the checks and relations between organic beings which have to struggle together in the same country i will only give a single instance which though a simple one interested me in Staffordshire, on the estate of a relation where i had ample means of investigation there was a large and extremely barren heath which had never been touched by the hand of man but several hundred acres of exactly the same nature had been enclosed twenty-five years previously and planted with scotch fir the change in the native vegetation of the planted parts of the heath was most remarkable more than is generally seen in passing from one quite different soil to another not only the proportional numbers of the heath plants were wholly changed but twelve species of plants not counting grasses and carices flourished in the plantations which could not be found on the heath the effect on the insects must have been still greater for six insectivorous birds were very common in the plantations which were not to be seen on the heath and the heath was frequented by two or three distinct insectivorous birds here we see how potent has been the effect of the introduction of a single tree nothing whatever else having been done with the exception of the land having been enclosed so that cattle could not enter but how important an element enclosure is i plainly saw near farnham in surrey here there are extensive heaths with a few clumps of old scotch firs on the distant hilltops within the last ten years large spaces have been enclosed and self-sown firs are now springing up in multitudes so close together that all cannot live when i ascertained that these young trees had not been sown or planted i was so much surprised at their number that i went to several points of view whence i could examine hundreds of acres of the unenclosed heath and literally i could not see a single scotch fir except the old planted clumps but on looking closely between the stems of the heath i found a multitude of seedlings and little trees which had been perpetually browsed down by the cattle in one square yard at a point some hundred yards distant from one of the old clumps i counted thirty-two little trees and one of them with twenty-six rings of growth had during many years tried to raise its head above the stems of the heath and had failed no wonder that as soon as the land was enclosed it became thickly clothed with vigorously growing young firs yet the heath was so extremely barren and so extensive that no one would ever have imagined that cattle would have so closely and effectually searched it for food here we see that cattle absolutely determined the existence of the scotch fir but in several parts of the world insects determine the existence of cattle perhaps paraguay offers the most curious instance of this for here neither cattle nor horses nor dogs have ever run wild though they swarm southward and northward in a feral state and azara and reniger have shown that this is caused by the greater number in paraguay of a certain fly which lays its eggs in the navels of these animals when first born the increase of these flies numerous as they are must be habitually checked by some means probably by other parasitic insects 
hence if certain insectivorous birds were to decrease in paraguay the parasitic insects would probably increase and this would lessen the number of the naval frequenting flies then cattle and horses would become feral and this would certainly greatly alter as indeed i have observed in the parts of south america the vegetation this again would largely affect the insects and this as we have just seen in Staffordshire, the insectivorous birds and so onwards in ever increasing circles of complexity not that under nature the relations will ever be as simple as this battle within battle must be continually recurring with varying success and yet in the long run the forces are so nicely balanced that the face of nature remains for long periods of time uniform though assuredly the merest trifle would give the victory to one organic being over another nevertheless so profound is our ignorance and so high our presumption that we marvel when we hear of the extinction of an organic being and as we do not see the cause we invoke cataclysms to desolate the world or invent laws on the duration of the forms of life i am tempted to give one more instance showing how plants and animals remote in the scale of nature are bound together by a web of complex relations i shall hereafter have occasion to show that the exotic lobelia fulgens is never visited in my garden by insects and consequently from its peculiar structure never sets a seed nearly all our orchidaceous plants absolutely require the visits of insects to remove their pollen masses and thus to fertilize them i find from experiments that humble bees are almost indispensable to the fertilization of the heart seas viola tricolor for other bees do not visit this flower i have also found that the visits of bees are necessary for the fertilization of some kinds of clover for instance twenty heads of dutch clover trifolium repens yielded two thousand two hundred and ninety seeds but twenty other heads protected from bees produced not one again one hundred heads of red clover t pretens produced two thousand seven hundred seeds but the same number of protected heads produced not a single seed humble bees alone visit red clover as other bees cannot reach the nectar it has been suggested that moths may fertilize the clovers but i doubt whether they could do so in the case of the red clover from their weight not being sufficient to depress the wing petals hence we may infer as highly probable that if the whole genus of humble bees became extinct or very rare in england the heart seas and the red clover would become very rare or wholly disappear the number of humble bees in any district depends in a great measure upon the number of field mice which destroy their combs and nests and colonel newman who has long attended to the habits of humble bees believes that quote, more than two-thirds of them are thus destroyed all over england End quote. now the number of mice is largely dependent as every one knows on the number of cats and colonel newman says quote, near villages and small towns i have found the nests of humble bees more numerous than elsewhere which i attribute to the number of cats that destroy the mice End quote. hence it is quite credible that the presence of a feline animal in large numbers in a district might determine through the intervention first of mice and then of bees the frequency of certain flowers in that district in the case of every species many different checks acting at different periods of life and during different seasons or years probably come into play some one check or some few being generally the most potent but all will concur in determining the average number 
or even the existence of the species. In some cases it can be shown that widely different checks act on the same species in different districts. When we look at the plants and bushes, clothing and entangled bank, we are tempted to attribute their proportional numbers and kinds to what we call chance. But how false of you is this? Everyone has heard that when an American forest is cut down, a very different vegetation springs up. But it has been observed that ancient Indian ruins in the southern United States, which must formerly have been cleared of trees, now display the same beautiful diversity and proportion of kinds as in the surrounding virgin forests. What a struggle must have gone on during long centuries between the several kinds of trees, each annually scattering its seeds by the thousand. What war between insects and insects, between insects, snails, and other animals, with birds and beasts of prey, all striving to increase, all feeding on each other, or on the trees, their trees and seedlings, or on the other plants which first clothed the ground, and thus checked the growth of the trees. Throw off a handful of feathers, and all fall to the ground according to definite laws. But how simple is the problem where each shall fall, compared to that of the action and reaction, the innumerable plants and animals, which have determined, in the course of centuries, the proportional numbers and kinds of trees now growing on the old Indian ruins. The dependency of one organic being on another, as of a parasite on its prey, lies generally between beings remote in the scale of nature. This is likewise sometimes the case with those which may strictly be said to struggle with each other for existence as in the case of locusts and grass-feeding quadrupeds. But the struggle will almost invariably be most severe between the individuals of the same species, for they frequent the same districts, require the same food, and are exposed to the same dangers. In the case of varieties of the same species, the struggle will generally be almost equally severe, and we sometimes see the contest soon decided. For instance, if several varieties of wheat be sown together, and the mixed seed be re-sown, some of the varieties, which best suit the soil or climate, or are naturally the most fertile, will beat the others and so yield more seed, and will, consequently, in a few years, supplant the other varieties. To keep a mixed stock of even such extremely close varieties as the various colored sweet peas, they must be, each year, harvested separately, and the seed then mixed in due proportion. Otherwise the weaker kinds will steadily decrease in number and disappear. So again with the varieties of sheep. It has been asserted that certain mountain varieties will starve out other mountain varieties, so that they cannot be kept together. The same result has followed from keeping together different varieties of the medicinal leech. It may even be doubted whether the varieties of any of our domestic plants or animals have so exactly the same strength, habits, and constitution that the original proportions of a mixed stock, crossing being prevented, could be kept up for a half a dozen generations if they were allowed to struggle together in the same manner as beings in a state of nature, if they were allowed to struggle together in the same manner as beings in a state of nature, and if the seed, or young, were not annually preserved in due proportion. Struggle for life most severe between individuals and varieties of the same species. As the species of the same genus usually have, though by no means invariably, much similarity in habits and constitution, and always in structure, the struggle will generally be more severe between them, if they come into competition with each other, than between the species of distinct genera. We see this in the recent extension over parts of the United States, with one species of swallow having caused the decrease of another species. The recent increase of the missile thrush in parts of Scotland has caused the decrease of the song thrush, 
how frequently we hear of one species of rat taking the place of another species under the most different climates in russia the small asiatic cockroach has everywhere driven before it its great cogener in australia the imported hive bee is rapidly exterminating the small stingless native bee one species of charlock has been known to supplant another species and so in other cases we can dimly see why the competition should be most severe between allied forms which fill nearly the same place in the economy of nature but probably in no one case could we precisely say why one species has been victorious over another in the great battle of life a corollary of the highest importance may be deduced from the foregoing remarks namely that the structure of every organic being is related in the most essential yet often hidden manner to that of all other organic beings with which it comes into competition for food or residence or from which it has to escape or on which it preys this is obvious in the structure of the teeth and talons of the tiger and in that of the legs and claws of the parasite which clings to the hair on the tiger's body but in the beautifully plumed seeds of the dandelion and in the flattened and fringed legs of the water beetle the relation seems at first confined to the elements of air and water yet the advantage of the plumed seeds no doubt stands in the closest relation to the land being already thickly clothed with other plants so that the seeds may be widely distributed and fall on unoccupied ground in the water beetle the structure of its legs so well adapted for diving allows it to compete with other aquatic insects to hunt for its own prey and to escape serving as prey to other animals the store of nutriment laid up within the seats of many plants seems at first sight to have no sort of relation to other plants but from the strong growth of young plants produced from such seeds as peas and beans when sown in the midst of long grass it may be suspected that the chief use of the nutriment in the seed is to favour the growth of the seedlings whilst struggling with other plants growing vigorously all around look at a plant in the midst of its range why does it not double or quadruple its numbers we know that it can perfectly well withstand a little more heat or cold dampness or dryness for elsewhere it ranges into slightly hotter or colder damper or drier districts in this case we can clearly see that if we wish in imagination to give the plant the power of increasing in numbers we should have to give it some advantage over its competitors or over the animals which prey on it on the confines of its geographical range a change of constitution with respect to climate would clearly be an advantage to our plant but we have reason to believe that only a few plants or animals range so far that they are destroyed exclusively by the rigour of the climate not until we reach the extreme confines of life in the arctic regions or on the borders of an utter desert will competition cease the land may be extremely cold or dry yet there will be competition between some few species or between the individuals of the same species for the warmest or dampest spots hence we can see that when a plant or animal is placed in a new country among new competitors the conditions of its life will generally be changed in an essential manner although the climate may be exactly the same as in its former home if its average numbers are to increase in its new home we should have to modify it in a different way to what we should have had to do in its native country for we should have to give it some advantage over a different set of competitors or enemies it is good thus to try in imagination to give any one species an advantage over another probably in no single instance should we know what to do this ought to convince us of our ignorance on the mutual relations of all organic beings a conviction as necessary as it is difficult to acquire 
all that we can do is to keep steadily in mind that each organic being is striving to increase in a geometrical ratio that each at some period of its life during some season of the year during each generation or at intervals has to struggle for life and to suffer great destruction when we reflect on the struggle we may console ourselves with the full belief that the war of nature is not incessant that no fear is felt that death is generally prompt and that the vigorous the healthy and the happy survive and multiply End of chapter three of the origin of species by means of natural selection by charles darwin this librivox recording is in the public domain